My parents, uh, although they were born in Jerusalem, they were speaking to each other in, in Arabic all the time, especially when they did not want me to understand what they said. But it doesn't matter. Erev Tov, and uh, Bonsoir, and Masar Kher, and Good Evening. And uh, the Jews celebrate uh, Passover in order to mark the redemption, the freedom from uh, years of slavery in Egypt. But when you tell the Egyptians that the Jews built the pyramids, they get annoyed, <laughs> yeah? They say, what? The Jews? Well, we built them, the Egyptians. Anyway. Well, ask, what, ask Egyptologists. <laughs> yeah, ask I see, the judges uh, deny that the Jews were involved in, in building the pyramids. Anyway, so it's all about symbolic food. Excuse Victor, me, yes. excuse me. He interrupts me already, yeah. I to Okay. My my Rav she had two and gone to the pyramid. Of course. Just forget that. Yeah, okay. He's saying that the critical mass of the Jews who became, who were slaves, yeah. as the Torah described it, yes, they were also very much involved in building the, the cities that are around uh, uh, Cairo of today, as well as uh, also in the south. So they, they built the south. Now, everything is symbolic, which means, as um, Rafa was saying, this uh, particular uh, source is called uh, Haroset, uh, very tasty, delicious, yes? It is to commemorate the cement with which the slavers, the Hebrews, built all the monuments in ancient Egypt. But when you taste it, it's so nice and beautiful that you wonder, is that how we celebrate slavery? By eating good food? Yeah. <laughs> Well, a question, of course. And the matzah is uh, not a bread, really. This is a, a, a factory-made matzah, and this is handmade matzah. It is to commemorate the fact that when Pharaoh, the Egyptian king, told them at long last, go and leave me alone, I don't want you anymore, after so many attempts and punishments inflicted on him by God, they did not have the time to bake the full bread before leaving Egypt. So they did left it in a hurry, and that was the result, the outcome of that. That's why the Jews eat matzah for seven for seven days every year, and, and most of them it. and most of them hate it. By the way, they don't <laughs> like it at all. Yes, they kept complaining all the time. But if you commemorate slavery, you have to suffer, right? You can't enjoy yourself all the time. This is the basic uh, element of uh, redemption and freedom from slavery. And mind you, by the way, if you read the Torah, uh, the book of, uh, say, uh, Genesis, or the book of Exodus, you could see that the Israelites in the desert were complaining all the time that God and Moses took them away from Egypt. Because Egypt for them, after wandering around in the desert for so many years, Egypt suddenly looked like a paradise. And they kept complaining to Moses, why did you bring us here? We remember the watermelons and the mushrooms and even the garlic that we ate in Egypt. And what do we have here in the desert? Mind you, you should remember also that when Moses came back from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he saw that the Israelites did not have the patience to wait for him. So they built a gold cult and they started worshiping him like the ancient Egyptians used to do. So God punished the Jews for not obeying him and he made them wander around in the desert for 40 years until they reached the promised land called Canaan or Israel of today. 
So this is basically what Passover is, is all about. Okay, maybe I can show you now. It's a private story. Hmm? Maybe I can show you now. It's a private story. But I'm going to show you now. I'm going to show you now. I'm going to show you now. My mother language is French because my mother is from Tunis and my, my father is from Jerba. So my mother spoke, spoke French, but my father didn't spoke a word in French. So they spoke Arabic together. And, and, and we actually grew up in, in Arabic uh, in Jerusalem after, after we came, after we, we moved from Tunis to, to Jerusalem. And we spoke Arabic because the, grandfather, the grandmother spoke only Arabic. They didn't, she didn't spoke a word in Hebrew. And she spoke the very specific dialect of Jerba, very specific. She had the shefshari and everything on the so sofa. So they did not communicate with each other. Everybody was speaking a different language. My grandmother had a different language and completely. You know, there is such a miscommunication. <laughs> miscommunication, that's the thing. I mean, my parents always call me miscommunication. And, um, and, and it was very hard. I mean, my, my grandmother was, uh, she had her own language and my grandfather's own language. My grandfather was, he had a matbaa, he had a printing house in Jerba, the biggest one in North Africa for Hebrew letters. So he was publishing books from Morocco, from Algeria, from Tunis, uh, and um, and uh, and that's actually the language where I grew up in a way. And we used and we used we used to come here to Tunis all the time because my uncle was the chief rabbi of Tunisia, and we, we used to come to Tunis uh, uh, almost every year to, for the summer. So so the language is always like uh, appeared and reappeared. Uh, and I want to, like, in a short, you know, some of you know, uh, like, this, my, my personal freedom story. I have several freedom stories, actually, uh, fortunately. Um, uh, seven years ago, exactly, in Passover, I was, I was, I was in Abu Slim prison in Libya by uh, doing nothing. Um, and it was actually a complex situation because Ben Ali, then the ruler of this country, was a friend of my uncle. So he asked my release from Gaddafi, and uh, Gaddafi said, uh, Gaddafi understood he had a, 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 a bargain in his hands because of Ben Ali asked personally my release. So they just left me in prison in Abu Slim, isolated, for almost six months. I was staying there. Um, I was there like a few weeks before Pesach. I remember that very good because Pesach for many people is a freedom holiday. And then I was there. How did you know it was Pesach? I know because I was there after Purim. Purim is the one month before Pesach. It's the holiday when you, it's like uh, Halloween. And, uh, and I remember Pesach, and I remember in Pesach itself, uh, uh, my relative, maybe Bernard Noim, Uzifa Trabelsi. You know Uzifa Trabelsi? He's my family relative. He's the cousin of my mother. He was the consulate of Tunis in Chad. And he had a lover in Tripoli, a lover in Chad. He's a crazy man, Bernard can say also. You don't know him, so that's good. Okay, so Zifa was in Tripoli during Pesach and met Gaddafi personally, asked him to release me only for Pesach and then bring me back. It was a very strange request because Pesach for people is like, you need to be free, you cannot be really in prison. But, but after that, many leaders like Sarkozy and Berlusconi and many people that I don't like personally ask my release. And in the end, uh, the son of Gaddafi uh, helped me escape in a private jet. It's a very strange story. But you are not that, uh, sure, 100%. No, this one I'm, I'm sure now. Yeah. I, I understood. Uh, one, which one? Uh, safe. Safe, yes. And he organized a, a private jet three days before my public trial. That was actually very, very, supposed to be very fast. And a billionaire, a Jewish Austrian billionaire, came from Sardinia by a private jet and took me to Vienna. And I had a nice wine in the jet and uh, fish. After six months without seeing anything, only eating couscous, camel couscous, a camel couscous and camel rice and camel pasta, karuna. That's the food we have in uh, Abu Slim. And a few months later, I mean, Abu Slim was uh, demolished almost, like it was like uh, completely out of order. And Gaddafi died, and everything changed. And, and we in the Pesach after. and I celebrate the Pesach. As we do now, after as Pesach, we celebrate Pesach. Yes, Pesach after Pesach and uh, double Pesach. And uh, yes, I mean this is uh, yeah. this is my story. So it's like a, it's a very short in a nutshell. But this is uh, for me, Pesach is like that. I mean, I guess in Libya that was the only proof they needed. Yeah. <laughs> they have nothing. I have a funny story about uh, Libya. Yeah, about Libya. It was during my preparation for my my degree. Of course, I will. <laughs> for my master's degrees, because I'm a musician, I'm teacher at the University of Music. 
and I got, I mean, to prepare for my, uh, you know, uh, my research and so, I, I met with uh, one of the biggest, like, uh, you know, uh, protectors of the Tunisian, you know, traditional music. Which his name is Salah al Mahdi. Maybe some people know, know, know about him. So I met with Salah al Mahdi and I had some interview with him. And I asked him about uh, how can I, uh, what shall I do, what kind of uh, uh, information shall I have from Libya because I, I'm willing to go there to make, um, you know, to, to meet musicians and take all the traditional music there. And he goes like, I'm going to tell you a secret. It was because of, uh, during 1964, Bourguiba told him and asked him to go for a mission to Libya to take care of their music. And it was like a secret information, and I have to tell because you know everywhere I go, I need to share this information because it's so important. So uh, Bourguiba asked him to do that because here, if we talk about our music here and in Algeria and in Morocco, Morocco, there was a lot of work to protect the traditional music. You know, there is like all these shuuch. Uh, they come here, you know, uh, during like you know in a, in a big meeting, and they start to, to sing and they start to write. In order to preserve for the, you know, the the, the traditional music, the so the maluf exactly. And then in Bourguiba's mind, it was so important to to do something for Libya because if we say the maluf al Tunisi or the maluf al Garnati Ziri, they are here, but about Libya, we we know nothing. So uh, he said to me, "Man, you're doing something really important." So. Go and uh, you're going to meet uh, Mr. Mohamed Marshen and uh, Hassan Laribi. So I got the chance to meet both of them. So the story is Hassan Laribi and Mohamed Marshen, they, went, they arrived here to Tunisia and they were studying here in Rashidaya school. And Mohamed Marshen succeeded his diploma of music and Hassan Laribi, he failed. And then when they left back to Libya, uh, Hassan Laribi took his like a, you know uh, a, a good position because he was like a leader of the radio uh, uh, m m musical troupe, and Mohammed Marshan got nothing, so he left to escape to to to, to Asia, and I arrived there to Libya and I found Mohammed Marshan and Hassan Laribi died at that time. We were talking, and he confirmed me this story that Bourguiba was one, you know, who was the one who contribute to, the, to preserve the, the um, traditional Libyan music. And I made my research to find, you know, the original uh, songs and so... But unfortunately, if today we search on what is called the Malouf al Libi, we find that it's cassettes, you know, uh, not even CDs. So for these little cassettes, they are, you know, performed with Egyptian musicians, you know, mm. so... And I can consider myself as a lucky, you know, man to, to have in my house, you know, all the traditional music in discs. And I convert them into MP3s. But from, you know, shiuch like Mohammed Gnis, you know, the old traditional version. And I started to make a project to preserve the same way like in Tunisia here or in, in, uh, in Algeria and in Morocco. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there was the, you know, the revolution arrived to Libya. So I stopped my project. And uh, I'm looking forward to continue back and to give them, you know, in books, their traditional music preserved. So, that's sorry about it.
Arabic is my original mother tongue. English is my later mother tongue, so I'll begin in Arabic. Um, and it's Michael Diab, and I'm in Masr. We were in Libya. We did a nephew of Horia in the same So it's a story of exile and freedom at the same time. The reason I was born in Libya, in Tripoli, was because my uh, parents had to flee Egypt because uh, they discovered that the state security was out to arrest my father. For doing what? For being a dissident. anti Nasser. No, anti sadat mm -hmm. My father was uh, uh, from uh, the Nasser era. He was uh, part of the... He, he, was, uh, he headed uh, part of the youth movement uh, during the Nasser years, in the late 60s, mid to late 60s. And then when uh, Sadat took over, when Nasr, Nasr died, he had, Sadat had what he called Sawrat al-Tasheeh, which means a corrective revolution, which wasn't really a revolution, it was just basically a purge of all uh, the Nasserists and balancing them out with Islamists, um, or embracing Islamists. Um, so my father was tipped off before he was uh, arrested that there was a file being co concocted against him and so he and my mum were engaged at the time they married in a hurry and they like uh, skipped the border to uh, Libya and during the revolution in 2011 my father somebody actually managed to salvage my father's file from state security the, like uh, a number of state security buildings went up in flames and uh, the theory is that it was actually an inside job to get rid of all the evidence. But some of the, a lot of the evidence was still salvaged by, uh, you know, revolutionaries who went inside and tried to get the documents. So my father's own file fell into his hands, apparently, at the time. And, yeah, and he saw there was, they were creating serious alternative facts about him. <laughs> and so I was born in exile. Uh, but at the time, um, it was easier uh, to... We never had the official status of refugees. Uh, it was relatively easy for my parents to move around. Uh, Libya was open to Egyptians at the time. And, and later, when we moved to the UK, the UK didn't have the same strict immigration rules it has now. So my parents were never officially... Uh, refugees, but they were they had left their country for political reasons and out of fear of persecution. So, technically, uh, they were refugees, even if they didn't have the status. Um, and we actually had to we tried to uh, leave Egypt a second time after Libya. My uh, my mom went home to Egypt to give birth to my sister. And my dad went to England to find us a home there. And uh, wh while he was in England, they, the government refused to let my uh, family, my mum, leave because <coughs> they wanted to try and use her and the children as a way to force my father to come back to Egypt. So my mum uh, took the government to court, and she won every time. But every time... No sooner had she got a verdict from the judge saying we were allowed to leave Egypt that they put her back on the blacklist, the, the no uh, travel list. Uh, so she goes to the airport. The first time this happened, my f the, people, the family who had taken us to the airport went home because they thought, okay, you know, they've gone through customs, they're getting on the plane. So we came out and there was no one there to take us home. Uh, but after that, they stayed at the airport and, until they knew the plane was in the air. Um, and yeah, and uh, I think this is, um, the experience of uh, growing up in this way has um, shaped to some extent who I am, and it's also um, made me appreciative of the status of refugees who have to flee much more dangerous situations. You know, ours was a you know, the situation we fled was a sort of more personal risk, not a general risk. 
And it's also made me um, more appreciative of minorities because I feel that I've spent, even though in Egypt I technically belong to majority, I've spent the greater part of my life living in societies in which I'm not part of the majority. And even the time I spent in Egypt, I wasn't really part of the majority because, you know, they saw me as a khawaga, because I lived abroad, my values were quite different from the mainstream and so on. So, um, and in these times where minorities and anyone who's different is seen with suspicion, I think it's good to celebrate diversity and to celebrate uh, pluralism. <coughs> Uh, what does Tunisian look like? That's the thing. I travel like uh, in <laughs> <laughs> And I meet Arabs, they say, no, no way that you're Tunisian. You're too black to be Tunisian. Um, and I said, I'm sorry, but uh, there are black people. We have so, black people sorry. in Egypt. I mean, yeah, black, black Egyptians. In that's the thing. So, minority. Yeah. Um, my, my mother tongue is uh, Tunisian Arabic, but a specific Tunisian Arabic, southern Tunisian Arabic. Um, I'm going to just to give an example of how we in the south of Tunisia speak. And in Mizrzis, when you need we as a Akeri. Of course, when I came to Tunis, I lived for 10 years in the south. When I came to Tunis, uh, in high school, I studied in a very French speaking high school, Alice Alawi. Kids used to make fun of me because I, they would say, go back to Libya. Because your accent is too Libyan to be Tunisian. <coughs> and I used to cry, and I had to switch to Tunisia. So I didn't have to go to So that, you know, that migration between, um, uh, between different dialects so became uh, shaped my identity. And it's hard sometimes you know, to be accepted when you are different. In a country that, was, uh, that shaped um, Tunisianness on being homogeneous. That's the Bourguiba model. And uh, I'm a rebellious person because I'm from the south of Tunisia. And uh, southerners have always been, unfortunately, you know, against the system in Tunisia, whether Bourguiba or Ben Ali. So we have always been considered as, you know, um, you know, alayhim. People who are, you know, have always been um, regarded as um, uh, um, uh, the ones who will never um, um, submit to the to the to the authority. I mean. Yeah, troublemakers, <laughs> exactly. Infanterie. Uh, and uh, for exactly, well, a, a mix of everything, <laughs> I have to say. And this also brings me to, back to Libya, because uh, I chose to go to Libya uh, to cover the Libyan revolution and its aftermath shortly after, actually, I arrived there for the first, well, third time, because I've been to Libya in 2008 and 9, but that was for shopping, because most Tunisians they would go to Libya at the time for shopping. It used to be called the Dubai of Africa for some people, cover, anyways. Cover for whom? Huh? Cover for whom? Uh, well, then, after the revolution, I, I went to cover it for, I was covering it for my newspaper, Tunisian newspaper in English called Tunisia Live. Mm -hmm. So I was there four days after Gaddafi fled uh, Tripoli. Yani, uh, when I was in Tripoli seeing Bab I was like, wow, this Bab must be turned one day into a museum. Because I was very naive thinking you know, that Libyans might do like the Germans have done, you know, <laughs> turn something, you know, ugly into something, you know, beautiful. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So, um, uh, and I found that Libyan Arabic or Libyan was closer to my heart than Tunisia, unfortunately. <laughs> and sometimes I feel that I'm betraying my Tunisianness because I'm not, because I'm, I feel يعني, closer to, 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 to how Libyans, uh, our Libyan you know, life, you know, يعني, يأكلوا زميطة, ويأكلوا بيديهم, وبزين, all these things, you know, that's close to my heart. Whereas um, coming back to Tunis, when I was in Libya, I would, I would miss Tunis. Like, wow, I miss the brioche, croissant, and all that, because it's beautiful, and like, that's Tunis. And yeah, that's basically how I am. I mean, I'm a limbo girl, I, and, I, and I'm a minority person, I'm a different person, I'm happy with that. I worked a lot on refugees and asylum seekers because I think there are people who need a lot of attention, and I think um, that's my, one of my missions you know, right now as a researcher, as a journalist, you know, to try and give some hope for these people who are suffering every day. And... Um, <rire> Alors, on a parlé beaucoup de la, de la Libye. On a beaucoup parlé de la Libye, puisque c'est une histoire extraordinaire de la Libye. La seule chose que je peux dire, c'est que nous sommes originaires de la Libye, de la famille Tayeb, vient, vient de Libye. C'est le seul point commun qu'on a avec, les, avec la Libye. Voilà. Mais en fait, on est installé en Tunisie depuis des générations. 
Alors, je vais parler juste d'un symbole qui est le Coca-Cola, ce qui n'a rien à voir avec Pâques normalement, mais qui est Coca-Cola en fait. Alors, je rappelle juste comment ça, comment ça se présentait quand j'étais gamin. Donc, on avait, en fait, c'est extraordinaire parce que les bouteilles de Coca-Cola qu'on vendait chez l'épicier étaient cachères. On avait donc un petit, un petit bout de papier qui était enfin, comme un autocollant sur, le, sur, le, sur, la, sur, la, sur la bouteille de Coca-Cola. Et on allait donc euh, boire le Coca. On demandait à l'épicier Coca, du Coca cachère. Donc, c'était euh, évident, il n'y a pas de problème. Et bien sûr, le reste, pas qu'il était n'était pas très, très frugal, il y avait juste, juste les, les galettes, bon, bien sûr, le, les salades, le, la viande, les fruits, d'accord voilà. Et on était tous en famille, bien sûr, à l'époque, il y avait les, les familles, les parents, les, les cousins, etc. Donc c'était une, une fête très familiale. En plusieurs années ont passé ensuite, et après, bien sûr, le, le, la communauté juive s'est dispersée. Et il se trouvait que quand je revenais à Tunis pour passer Pâques, je, je ramenais avec moi des Coca-Cola, d'accord, de France. Donc à la douane, ils se demandaient pourquoi j'avais des Coca-Cola. Parce qu'ils se disaient, c'est quoi, on, on a des Coca-Cola à Tunis, pourquoi tu ramènes donc, donc ils n'ont pas très bien compris pourquoi je ramenais, donc je leur ai expliqué. Puis un jour, j'arrive au port avec du Coca-Cola, des paquets de, des paquets de matza, et la, la, la femme qui était là à la douane, elle me dit, bon, c'est quoi ces paquets de matza Ce paquet, c'est des matza, c'est des euh, rien. Elle me dit, euh, bon, on veut, il faut ouvrir. Je dis, non, non, je dis, on ne peut pas ouvrir. Alors elle me dit, alors je dis, dis, moi je vais ouvrir. Je dis, non, ni toi ni moi, personne ne va ouvrir. Je, elle me dit, ah bon, mais qu'est-ce qui qu se passe Je dis, non, ça c'est pour la fête. Alors elle me dit, bon, attends un instant, elle est partie appeler le, le, le grand patron. Elle a dit, bon, le grand patron, il, il connaissait, je pense, les, ce que c'était que, que les médecins. Donc il m'a dit, ok, bon, il a dit à la femme, la laisse tomber, est-ce qu'elle dit, se passer Puis quand, quand je suis sorti, il m'a appelé, il m'a dit, bon. Euh, S'il te plaît, il y a Chouya, il ne peut pas me donner, je crois qu'il y a des, quelques matzot, bon, quelques, quelques galettes pour moi. Voilà. Et puis maintenant, cette année, donc, le temps a passé aussi, maintenant cette année, donc, le dernier Pessar qu'on a passé, le Coca-Cola n'existe pas en Tunisie, ils l'ont fait juste à Djerba, à une bouteille qui coûte 18 dinars la bouteille, donc le, on n'a pas pu l'acheter. Donc cette année, c'est vraiment le, le pack euh, très rudimentaire, ça veut dire avec les galettes, de l'eau, c'est le vrai pack comme les Hébreux ont quitté à ce moment-là l'Égypte avec le, le minimum. Ce n'est pas comme en France ou en Europe, on a pratiquement la même... Euh, on a les fromages, les yaourts, on, les pâtes même presque, avec des, même du pain à la rigueur, enfin, des, des tranches de pain en fait, avec de, des galettes. Donc là, c'est vraiment, c'était très, très, très le minimum, légumes, euh, viande et galettes et, et de l'eau. Voilà. Donc voilà. Donc c'est ça le symbole et de la, du vrai pack, en fait. The compound living and the lack of liberty related to that. Although I spent the last three and a half years uh, in, in pretty similar conditions, but I want to talk about uh, freedom of the people of the place. I was also not very free to move in. Um, the freedom of movement as an important aspect of life and how people. Um, deal with that if you don't have the freedom of movement in a place that's actually closed uh, for Pesach holidays. Um, there's many ways, of course, to get around the lack of freedom of movement, um, productive ways, music, cinema, arts, not so productive ones, drugs, suicide, so on. But I'll tell you three stories about people who um, dealt with the lack of freedom of movement uh, in a particular way. And then lastly, I'll tell you how it links to uh, me enjoying or not enjoying my freedom of movement. The first is of a colleague, his name is Ibrahim. And he and his uh, wife were just <coughs> married. And his wife, Mai, said, oh, I'd like to see the world because part of freedom of movement is interaction with different cultures, different societies. But unfortunately, we cannot go anywhere. Uh, so Ibrahim says to his wife, no problem, we will travel tonight. She's like, oh, OK, really interesting. So uh, Mai comes home from work in the evening. And Ibrahim tells her, OK, let's go to Australia. On the door of the bedroom, was the map of Australia. He says, 
اهلا وسهلا في استراليا so they entered the bedroom visit australia next up uh, paris because it's a city for romance so the kitchen paris the living room i can remember must have been london the other bedroom america so that's how they traveled the world in an evening within the space of their house uh, the second story is is actually quite a sad one because i heard it at the funeral uh, of a friend's mother uh, his father had died only five days before and the mother died i think out of grief five days later and they lived um on on the border of the place they're, they're, they're in and could actually see the place where the parents had grown up, um, where they were children and where they fled from, um, only with their clothes. And the mother had surprisingly taken, a, taken the bread-making um, the oven with her because they thought that's the only thing we need. We're only going to stay here for a short time. So the house where they lived was overlooking the place they used to live and where the family used to live so many years before. They could see it every day, yet uh, they could not visit it. The few times they visited it, they actually had picnics in the fields where they lived and thought it was paradise. Uh, the last story is of this young boy, Mohammed. He's 13. And because he's 13, he's well into social media, um, internet, everything. And he has a dream. He wants to see the world, but he wants to see the world his way. So uh, he enrolled in a program that's called something or other, Sky Geeks, where um, an organization helps young people or people with an, an ambition to set up startups, mainly in the IT and communications world. So Mohammed's 13 get special leave from school, is supported by Google and a number of other big uh, companies. He can go to Silicon Valley, so Silicon Valley comes to him. Uh, and now he has, at the age of 13, a uh, $1 million startup wow. uh, doing online things, providing online services, because he cannot go anywhere. How does this link uh, with me? Um, every week I was acutely aware, because I was in this place for work purposes, acutely aware of my freedom, because I could uh, see my son and husband uh, every weekend. But there's two times I was even more acutely aware of this. One was in the summer of 2014, when I was leaving behind uh, colleagues who were not in a terribly safe place at the time. Um, to go and see my family, who I hadn't seen for six or seven weeks by that time. And the other time was two and a half months ago now, when I left this particular place, knowing that I'd leave behind a lot of friends who I, unless I have a special visa and a special permit, uh, I will never be able to see again, because I cannot visit the place um, just when I want to, and they cannot visit me. That was my story. Well. يبيعوا في سفاقس حلو اللي يسميهم سمودي مدام سمودي كانت صانع البام انضمي في سفاقس وهي تعلمت من عندنا مش تعرفوا مدام سمودي اي اي مش تعرفوا دوله دوله اسمع احنا باش نقولوا لكم اليود من الكلو من الكلوش الخميره مش الخبز الخميره اللي تم في الخبز وكيفاش الفرينه هي تخمر وتطلع دونك ممنوع علينا تعملوا حتى ماء وفرينه وتخلي نفسها يخمر ممنوع لازم 
كيف كيف تخلط الفارينة والماء توت سويت في النار شا عملوا اليود يحبوا يأكلوا حاجة خفيفة جاءوا الجرانة من إيطاليا وجابوا معهم قطوات اجتمع فيهم لوز ولا بندق ولا فاكهة فاكهة كلها يرحيوها ويحطوا العظم والسكر ويشنيا للسكرين تاع مدام مسمودي أكل البولات اللي تعمل لي هي لوجت بوكو دو آه. احنا كنا نعملوا اون بول اللي تسميها روح البي انتوما في تونس ها آه. خضرة وحمرة وهذا بقلة البي اي بقلة البي ما نعرفش كيفاش تسميوها احنا كنا نسميوها هذيك تما بوكا دي دما وتما بوكا دي دما لا بوكا ان ايطاليي دي دما دو لا دام بوش دو دام اوكي يا في ان اوتر غاتو كون ابلي غيزادا علاش غيزادا شنو يعني الكلمه الغيزادا غيزادا هي على خاطر كانوا ياخذوا ياخذوا اللوز ويقزعوهم باليودي قزعوهم يعني ترانش دي ترانش 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 ان كوموند ديال لونغلي لي ترانش فوالا لي ترانش بون دونك سو سي غاتو لا ما مير فوزي Elle les faisait pour Pâques, pour Bessah. Bessah, c'est la Pâques. C'était interdit de manger. Donc, il n'y a pas de farine. Il n'y a que du sucre, des œufs et des amandes ou des pistaches ou des, tout ce que tu veux en fruits secs. Et c'était très bon, c'était goûteux. Oui, je bats. Sokar, je bats. Ou la dame, je bats. Ou la dame, je bats. Donc, donc, on mangeait ça. Et c'est devenu aujourd'hui, et je suis content, Que un gâteau juif italien venu en Tunisie transformé en gâteau tunisien. Ah, Adam. Le bid. 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 ما نامنش بها انا الحريه تعرف نجم تهرب من الحبس تهرب من امراه اتا اتا ا بوتو سوفي دونك دون بريزون دون فام دون فامي دي زونفون دو دي دي زنمي تو بوت سوفي مي هي اون شوز كي كو بيرسون نو بو سو سوفي Dommage que je parle de ça, mais c'est la mort. Alors, oui, il y a le qui de toute façon doit partir au trou un jour. Donc, il n'y a pas de Il n'y a pas, ça n'existe pas. Le mot Horia, il n'existe pas. Pour moi, la liberté, c'est quoi la liberté C'est quoi la liberté hein, Moi, je travaille dans les tissus. Un jour, il y a quelqu'un qui me dit Ah, tu n'as tu pas un tissu liberté Je dois liberté à dire, allez, liberté. C'est un tissu avec des petits, des, des petits motifs, que ce soit des, des petits pois, ou bien des fleurs, ou bien des feuilles, n'importe. Et c'est quoi C'est ça la liberté Liberté en Angleterre Allez, Oui, c'est liberté. C'est ça. Donc, pour moi, la liberté, oui, quand quelqu'un est sorti de prison, il était dehors, il était en liberté, il est rentré en prison, il a été enfermé, il est ressorti, il a repris sa liberté. Mais quelle liberté Est-ce qu'on a les libertés d'expression On a la liberté d'expression, on n'a pas la liberté d'expression Est-ce que tu peux passer, par exemple, quelqu'un qui te bouscule ou qui te fait du mal Tu as la liberté, toi, de te, de te défendre ou bien Tu n'as presque pas la liberté. Tu dois l'attaquer par un jugement et si tu tombes sur un juge, il se retourne contre toi. C'est comme tout à l'heure, j'ai parlé des avocats. J'ai dit, il y a beaucoup de choses. Tout à l'heure, j'étais en cuisine, il manque des outils en cuisine parce que ce n'est pas une cuisine, c'est une petite cuisine, tu sais, pour, pour des chambres, faire des... Donc j'ai dit, il manque, il manque d'outillage. Et j'ai dit, le meilleur ouvrier du monde, s'il n'a pas d'outillage... Il ne peut pas travailler. Et je dis, c'est comme un avocat. Un avocat, tu prends le meilleur avocat du monde, qui, va te, qui tu veux qu'il te défende, il faut lui apporter les armes pour qu'il te défende. C'est pas lui, il cherche un petit peu, mais c'est à toi d'apporter les armes. Mais c'est un couteau à double tranchant. Pourquoi Parce qu'il peut se servir de ces armes-là pour se retourner contre toi et t'éliminer, s'il a envie de t'éliminer, pour te tirer de l'argent ou tirer quoi. C'est pour ça qu'il ne faut jamais dire à un avocat toutes ces armes. T'as compris C'est ce que je dis. Non, moi, je travaille avec les avocats. J'ai appris à connaître ces, cette race. C'est une race. C'est une race. C'est une race, les avocats. C'est une race que j'aime pas du tout. Mais on est obligé de passer par eux. Il y a des trucs. Donc, moi, la liberté, c'est quoi La liberté, c'est quand quelqu'un, il est joyeux. 
il s'amuse, il fait ce qui lui plaît. Il y en a qui aiment le sport, il y en a qui aiment la cuisine, il y en a qui aiment l'importe, la, l'art, le cinéma, le théâtre et tout ça. Mais liberté, réellement, on ne l'a pas dans ce monde. Tout en démocratie, il parle de démocratie. Quelle démocratie Quelle démocratie on prend aujourd'hui Moi, j'ai été voté. Il y a quelqu'un qui m'a dit, qu'est-ce que tu votes J'ai dit, je vote Fillon. Il me dit, pourquoi Je dis, parce qu'il a promis de rendre les costumes et l'argent qu'il a volé. Au moins, ça, on est sûr qu'il va peut-être, peut-être les rendre les rendre. Les autres, je n'ai pas confiance en eux. Donc, on n'a pas la liberté. Ils nous ont mis six, six guignols ou sept guignols. Choisissez parmi ces guignols-là un président. Est-ce qu'on a la liberté de... Bon, bon je parle un petit peu de tout ça. Rafram, c'est un garçon que j'ai connu il n'y a pas très longtemps que j'ai apprécié en le connaissant, parce qu'au début, euh, on s'est vu, il était un petit peu euh, spécial, hein, comme tous les artistes d'ailleurs. Je connais beaucoup d'artistes, tous les artistes sont un petit peu spéciaux, ils ont une mentalité spéciale. Et donc, quand j'ai compris que c'était un artiste, j'ai dit, bon, j'ai commencé à m'intéresser à lui, j'ai vu qu'il était très intéressant. C'est un garçon intéressant, et c'est un garçon qui a un bon cœur d'abord, et il est ouvert, il est pour l'amitié entre les peuples, il est, il est, pour la religion, il est comme moi, moi je, je, je crois en Dieu, mais je ne crois pas à, à tout le cinéma qu'il y a autour des religions. Pour moi, c'est du cinéma et du théâtre. Voilà, et je suis libre donc de choisir qui je veux. Donc je sais que Dieu, je dis il existe parce qu'il faut croire. Parce qu'on m'a appris quand j'étais petit qu'il faut croire en Dieu. Mais par exemple, moi le cachère et tout ça, et la viande et le halal et tout ça, tout ça c'est du cinéma pour moi. Voilà, voilà c'est... Et lui, je crois qu'il est comme moi. Il a, il a, C'est-à-dire il, il garde un petit peu les traditions juives. Mais en réalité, c'est bien de ne pas couper les chaînes, peut-être, pour les enfants et les futurs enfants. Mais moi, étant que je donnais que j'ai des enfants mélangés, moi, mes enfants, ils sont mélangés, puisque moi, je me suis marié avec, avec des femmes que j'ai aimées, et peu même porter la couleur de la peau, peu même porter la religion. J'en ai eu quatre femmes. Donc... <rire> Donc, <rire> et, euh, je suis même parti ici à Bosquet de Tunis parce que j'ai pris une musulmane ici. Et ils m'ont dit, monsieur, il faut te convertir. Je lui ai dit, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour convertir Tu lis la Fatha et tu chètes. J'ai fait la Fatha et je chète. Il m'a dit, ça y est, tu es musulman. J'ai dit, bon, si tu as... Si... <rire> j'ai dit, je suis musulman. <rire> j'ai écrit le contrat et c'est fini. <rire> Donc, pourquoi il n'y a pas de liberté dans le monde D'ailleurs, je n'ai pas eu la liberté, il fallait que je me convertisse à l'islam pour être libre de me marier. C'est une liberté, ça Non, ce n'est pas une liberté. Donc, la liberté, pour moi, elle n'existe pas. On parle de liberté des peuples, les politiques qui se battent entre eux. J'ai dit, monsieur, vous vous votez pour la terre. La terre, elle vous avale à tous. Tous. La liberté, il n'y a pas de liberté, elle vous avale. Vous vous êtes battu pour une terre, pour de la terre. Elle vous avale. Il n'y a rien, il n'y a rien à faire. Il n'y a rien à faire, on prend Jérusalem. C'est une ville, il n'y a pas une pierre où il n'y a pas de sang. Ça fait des dizaines de siècles que c'est en guerre. Quand on s'entretue, quand tu... Quand on, quand, où tu vois des, Pour de la terre. Ah, c'est la capitale. Quelle capitale Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire une capitale Il y a des villes, pour moi, toutes les villes. Je, je, aujourd'hui, je vais en Espagne. Pour moi, la capitale d'Espagne, c'est Valencia. Pour l'autre, c'est euh, Barcelone, il y a Madrid. Elles sont toutes des belles villes, elles sont grandes. Chacun, il veut. Moi, pour moi, une... pourquoi une capitale La capitale, c'est peut-être l'administrative. D'ailleurs, en Turquie, si tu vas, c'est, c'est, c'est... au Maroc, c'est Rabat, la capitale administrative, et pourtant, ils disent que la capitale, c'est Casablanca. Donc, moi, la liberté, comme je l'ai dit, je n'y crois pas. Alors, il m'a dit, il faut parler de liberté. Je lui ai dit, bon, alors, voilà, voilà, voilà ma liberté à moi, c'est mon expression à moi, c'est ce que je pense. Et je vous souhaite à tous une bonne... Un bon séjour en Tunisie ou ailleurs dans ce monde et de vivre heureux et une, heureux et une fraternité entre les peuples. And uh, je suis un peu comme vous, monsieur. Je ne crois pas que la liberté existe dans ce monde, mais je pense que c'est notre obligation toujours d'essayer de faire la réalité. Donc, même si les odds sont contre nous. Donc, comment vous faites ça Vous ne devenez pas cynique. Comment vous faites ça Vous essayez de. Vous essayez de. Vous essayez de. You know, say very cliche things like live in the moment. You try to say very cliche things like, you know, treat every day day like your last. But there's a lot of truth to it. And frustration is is not just an inner thing. It's also um, it's an external thing that I think, uh, unfortunately, in this patriarchal world we live in, um, is is communicated in many ways by young men, uh, whether they represent the state, whether they represent uh, 
non-state actors, I mean, talking specifically about uh, the police state that we have in the Arab world, and I won't name countries since you're filming me, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also the flip side of it, which is, which you know, you <laughs> <laughs> everywhere except for Tunis. Um, and then you talk about Daesh, too. You know, this is frustration everywhere. Um, so for me, what I try to do is uh, try to fight this very naturally occurring um, sentiment, feeling. We are écrasés, nous sommes entre le patriarchy ou le capitalism, and it's not very easy to, to live under both. And so, again, speaking from a man's perspective, you have these things that both rub you down, and then, unfortunately, one of the side effects of that is, is you know, um, that we take it out on women and, uh, uh, and, uh, and weaker, weaker people in general, or weaker entities in general, when déjà where we should understand that the system sets you up to be weak. So this is my thing when I talk about uh, one of the things that keep, I keep in mind all the time. Um, I was raised by a single mother. Uh, my fiancé is a single mother, or was. Um, and uh, I'm very aware of, uh, of uh, frustration in my life and the life of those around me. So I try to fight it. Thank you. Uh, Leila hasn't spoken yet. She, because she is not eating all the time. Leila <laughs> 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 speak now. It's not, uh, it's not exactly a personal story, but I just want to say that, uh, well, when I was young, I used to hate history. Is your mother I, language? No, my mother language is Tunisian. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I hate history because uh, it's all full of uh, people wanting to take things that, that don't belong to them. <laughs> so I can't remember dates, I can't remember stories, I was very bad in history and um, and today I feel like my mission is to prove the opposite, that there are nice people in history, we just don't talk about them. Uh, Tunisian history to me is uh, simply they come, we don't like them, and then they become family. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, this, this house is a proof of that. Um, the, the stones on the floor, um, the Arabs recycled from Carthage, the, the black and white is from Ottomans. I'm, an, I'm stupid in history, I'm just repeating what everybody else says. <laughs> the tiles are from Andalusia. Uh, the woodwork is from uh, Arabs, I don't know, the metalwork, uh, many, many iron smiths tell me that they, were, that they learned from some Jewish uh, artisans, so it's just, it's all in harmony, sitting together and showing that, uh, um, I'm sure all these people came, coming from different places in the Mediterranean, they came here because they wanted uh, to have a better life, and they did have a better life together. Um, so you were running away from history, and history is chasing you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> she has, she still has bills just to pay. <laughs> <laughs> the Andalusian tiles aren't quite paid for yet. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, the, I'm very happy to host this, uh, this beautiful dinner here. It's, it's my house, but... Uh, uh, I'm passing in history. The house is standing since 15th century, so I'm nobody for the house, and uh, I love to share it. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs>